Hi, I'm Jules Cuthbert. I'm a pharmacist in Bristol um, and um, yeah, I've come to talk about immunoglobulin a bit today. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, Hayley. Hi, I'm Hayley Clifford. So I'm the lead nurse for immunology um, at the University of Hospitals, Birmingham. Um, and I help to facilitate uh, treatment as day cases and um, training for those patients that require it at home. Thank you very much, Hayley, and thank you everybody for giving your time uh, and, and uh, really looking forward to this session and, and the discussion. So uh, without further ado, perhaps we can uh, allow Julie to um, introduce her talk and take it from here. Thanks, Nick. Um, so yeah, it was just a little bit of an introduction to my background and how I've come to be involved in immunoglobulin really. So. Um, I know I don't look it, but I've been a pharmacist for 20 years now, um, mainly in and around Bristol. Um, and I've been in my this role for the last four years. And the focus on immunoglobulin um, has become stronger and stronger as we've had um, problems with supply um, and new guidelines coming out. Um, so yeah, on the next slide, um, I've just outlined that I'm a pharmacist. So I come to this from um, the drugs point of view and um, that's my take on it. Within each region, we now have something called a sub-regional panel. Um, this um, was something that was introduced where I worked two and a half years ago. Um, previously, each hospital um, decided under national guidance who would get immunoglobulin um, and how that was administered. But I think nationally they wanted a little bit more um, consistency across the country. So I think the regional panels are one way that they're trying to ensure consistency. Um, and I am the panel member for my local Bristol Trust. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, I was trying to give an outline to what immunoglobulin is because um, I feel that some people in the audience may well be on immunoglobulin, others um, it might be a future treatment option. Um, so as today's talks are all about blood products, it is a blood product. Um, it's taken from blood donors, but not currently in the UK. Most of our supply comes from the US with quite a lot come from Europe. Um, they take whole blood um, and then take everything, they take the plasma, then take everything out apart from the immunoglobulin. Um, we don't currently do this at all in the UK. We used to, but we stopped. But due to current problems in getting hold of it and um, the global market, there's more and more immunoglobulin being used. The decision's been made that we are going to start splitting out in the UK, um, but that does take a long time. So plans are in place, but it's going to take a couple of years before we can start producing our own. Um, we'll probably go into this a little bit more later, um, but immunoglobulin can be given intravenously, which you tend to have to um, go to the hospital for, but some patients do receive it like that at home. Other patients have to have it more often in smaller volumes subcutaneously, um, which can be an advantage if you want to do it yourself or at home. Um, but there are pros and cons we might get into of both these different ways of having it delivered. So, all right, to move on to the next slide, please. Um, I'm sure some of you will have questions about this. Um, currently, there is a worldwide shortage of immunoglobulin. Um, this is been a problem for as long as I've been a pharmacist. Um, it's a limited supply. We can't just suddenly make some more. It's all from donations. So we've always had demand management problems um, in the UK. Sometimes these are felt more acutely and we are definitely feeling it more acutely at the moment. Um, the reasons we've been given is that during COVID, the amount of donations of blood were down and due to social distancing reasons, um, they could not get as many patients through the donation centres um, in a number of places as previously had happened. So they think we're going to have a shortage of supply for at least the next six, if not 12 to 18 months. Um, and this obviously leads to the really difficult problem of balancing the demand for this product, um, which is life saving for some and life altering for others with the amount that we have available to us. Um, yeah, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, we have national guidelines available for where and when immunoglobulin can be used. Um, 
about 15 years ago, everyone felt immunoglobulin would be the answer to every single clinical condition that was out there. Lots of people wanted to try it for absolutely anything. Um, so the national guidance have tried to pull together all the evidence to show where this um, finite product gets is the most effective. So these national guidance um, does try and reflect who benefits most from immunoglobulin. Um, this covers things like neurology. So patients um, that have neurological conditions can be seen to improve vastly um, on having immunoglobulin. Um, here in Bristol, we do use quite a lot of immunoglobulin in um, quite sick children with something called Kawasaki's disease. So they're admitted to our intensive care units. Um, they are very worried about these patients. They have certain symptoms um, and they need to give immunoglobulins within three to four hours of diagnosing that Kawasaki's to prevent cardiac problems. Um, we also have children treated here at the Bristol Children's Hospital because we're a specialist centre that um, are what we call primary um, immunodeficiency patients. So they're born with conditions or develop conditions where they do not have, um, they do not produce enough immunoglobulins. Um, lots of the patients um, that we, um, with leukemia, we would call secondary antibody deficiency. So due to a treatment that you've been given or um, your immune system following treatment means that your body is no longer producing the amount of immunoglobulin that might be needed. Um, the national guidance is currently being updated. It's been being updated for the last year, but we've been promised that they will be available in the next month or two. Um, we've been told that these guidelines will be similar to the ones before that set out who should receive immunoglobulins, what the criteria are, but due to the current shortage, they're also saying that they may rank the conditions with a code of one to four, one being life-saving and moving down through the numbers as in how much of an improvement immunoglobulin has on that patient group's life. Um, so that's something we are very interested to see when it comes out in possibly September now. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Thanks. So I thought I would outline the criteria for use for secondary antibody deficiency. Um, so this is the criteria that are in the national guidance. And when I go to my monthly panel meetings, if we have any new patients, we run through these criteria to check that the patients consistently meet these standards to ensure that everyone is treated fairly. So first of all, you'd have had a blood test to prove that you do have low um, immunoglobulins, and we take that as the national guidance to be less than four. Um, one of the other stipulations is that patients have either had recurrent or a very severe infection despite being on antibiotics for six months. Um, sometimes we've had patients that have been hospitalized with very nasty infections, um, and sometimes they're considered slightly differently if they had the full six months. Um, but that's what the national guidance says. For some patients, having a vaccine challenge is appropriate, but in practice, we find most of these patients, if you've already got low um, immunoglobulins, it's not practical to do a vaccine challenge. And we also have an emerging patient group um, within Bristol, I'm sure lots of other areas where they're post CAR T treatment um, and they've been shown to possibly require immunoglobulins more often than other groups of patients. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. So if patients are receiving ongoing immunoglobulin treatment, um, definitely in our local area, and I think nationally, we have received guidance to say that all patients on immunoglobulin should be reviewed. So that is something that every hospital trust should be doing anyway, but there's even more onus on ensuring that each patient is reviewed. Um, some trusts and definitely locally, our haematologists do advocate for a summer break. So they try and stop patients um, for a month or two, do a trough level to see what off treatment um, Ig levels are, and also do a review of how well have patients been um, in the last year, have they suffered any infections, have they needed antibiotics, um, to ensure that we're definitely still giving it to the patients that are gaining the most from treatment. Um, so that was my quick run through of immunoglobulin treatment. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions afterwards. Julie, 
<clears throat> Thank you very much. That's a great overview, and I'm sure you've simulated quite a few questions. I see a few already coming in. If it's okay, if we can uh, uh, follow on with all qu qu uh, questions together in the Q&A session, um, perhaps um, I could hand over to you, uh, Prof Chris, um, if possible, if you could give uh, an overview introduction of use of blood products across different leukemia types, the how, what, why, when, um, to set the scene before a Q&A from everyone. Uh, we, we haven't got an indication at the moment of the different types of patients uh, in the audience joining us. Um, so we have to assume that uh, anybody could be a patient from any type of leukemia. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Leukemia Care, for putting on this afternoon session uh, for everyone. You've invited me along to uh, uh, for five, 10 minutes to talk about blood products uh, in general. So the bone marrow is the source of all blood cells. We have what's called the hemopoietic stem cell in the marrow that goes on and produces red cells, white cells, and platelets. If you're a blood donor, you donate your pint of blood, what you're getting is what's called whole blood. That is everything in it. That's red cells, white cells, platelets, uh, that's plasma. Plasma is made up mostly of water, but in it is dissolved proteins, albumin, globulins, immunoglobulins we've heard about. Your hormones go through that, your nutrients, carbohydrates, fats, protein, you eat, it all goes through the plasma. So what you have is this super core plasma, which has in it red cells, white cells, and platelets. If you're a blood donor, or those of you who maybe once a time were, or you've got family or friends who are blood donors, you give your pint of blood. Before that, you have a health screen. Are you actually well yourself? Can you give it? Do you have active infection? That blood is then screened for various infections, including HIV, hepatitis, HTLV1, CMV, because certain infections can be transmitted in blood. There's often in blood is cultured as well to see if it's got bacteria in. A blood donor wouldn't normally have bacteria in the blood, but of course, when you put a needle through the skin into a blood vessel, if there's bacteria on the skin contaminating it, in theory, that can get into the blood bag you've donated and infect the bag. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that shortly, why that's important. So having given the pint of blood, it's really, really highly scientific not. You basically take that bag and you put it in a centrifuge and you spin it at a certain rate uh, for a certain time. And what happens, the red cells are heavier than the white cells, the platelets and the plasma. So the red cells shrink to the bottom. And all they do then is squeeze the bottom of the bag and out the tube at the top will come the plasma containing the white cells and the platelets. So that 500 mil bag, you will notice if you've had a red cell transfusion, it's not 500 mils in it because all the other things have been taken out of it. And it's typically around 225, 250 mils work to actually get in a red cell transfusion. So that plasma platelets and white cells is then spun down yet again, but much, much harder. And what that does is bring the platelets and the white cells to the bottom. And again, if you squeeze from the bottom, the plasma can be sifted off the top. And that plasma will then go on to be made into albumin, uh, to protein fractions, including the immunoglobulins that Julie talked about. Those products can all be heat treated uh, to kill any potential infective agents in it. You can't do that with cellular products because you would kill the cells. But yet enough immunoglobulin or enough albumin or enough protein, what you actually do there is pull the plasma from many, many, many donors. And that's why the risk of infection before heat treatment came along was so high. The reason why the UK gave up producing its own plasma was actually new variant CJD, BSE disease. Those who had eaten beef, we didn't have a test for it. The concern was that you could catch new variant CJD through blood products. We were producing our own plasma then, we were producing our own immunoglobulins, but it all stopped uh, with the BSE scare, which must be going on for over 20 years ago now. 
So that's what brought it to a crashing halt, which is why we had to import it from other countries that didn't have BSE in its population. So red cells are to treat anemia. The symptom of anemia is shortness of breath, tiredness, lethargy. Different centers have different thresholds uh, for giving red cells. Some use a threshold of seven grams, some use eight grams. When I was a lad, we used 10 grams, but we realized actually we're given a lot of blood and you can react to the blood. The blood is cross-matched between you and the donor, but that's only for the major sort of protein groups. Minor groups can come about and that can cause problems if you get multiple transfusions. So the aim now is to treat the symptomatic patient rather than have a threshold of red cells necessarily. In some patients, if you've got coronary heart disease, you may need your hemoglobin keeping above 10 to stop you getting angina. If you've got no heart disease and really very well before your illness, you may tolerate a hemoglobin of seven. So it varies from site to site and it really should vary from patient to patient. Red cells usually kept in a fridge. So if you come along to the hospital, you need red cells. There's usually a delay of an hour, an hour and a half while they cross match it there and then. Or you may be asked to come back the next day because it's, it's a reaction in the lab they're looking for to see if you react to the blood or the blood react to you. With platelets, the platelets are kept at room temperature. They're not kept in the refrigerator because they actually don't survive well if you keep them cool. The problem with that is platelets are much more likely to transfer infections. If you did get bacteria into the bag, the fact that the red cells are in the fridge stops bacteria growing. The fact the platelets are actually kept at room temperature means if by chance there was infection in there, uh, bacterial infection, that will grow while it's sat on the shelf. It's also on what's called an agitator. It rotates around slowly to stop the platelets aggregating. Typically, you need more than one platelet dose from one patient. Uh, you, uh, and the way to do that is either pull the platelets together, or what we can do now a lot more is actually we specifically put donors on machines to collect platelets only, a process called uh, plasmapheresis or leukopheresis or platelet-pheresis. So we can get more uh, platelets off one single donor. That means putting on a machine. That doesn't mean a bag of blood. The advantage of that is platelets also have different proteins on that you can react to. The problem with reacting is not only it makes you feel potentially unwell at the time, fever, aches, rashes. Often the platelets don't last as long if you've amounted a reaction to them. And the HLA group of proteins are very common ones that you can react to. And if you do start getting reactions to red cells or platelets, what we then try and do is match you HLA with the donor, but that slows the whole process down. Uh, it takes a lot more work and you find it's a lot more of a fiddle for yourselves, especially if you've got an uncommon HLA group. And that's particularly important for different, different ethnic groups because most blood donors in the UK are Anglo-Saxon white. And we do have slightly different blood groups from people of Asian origin or African origin uh, in reality. So you're more likely to react um, with that. We don't tend to use white cell uh, infusions. Those are very, very rare to give. Typically, white cells don't live very long. Neutrophils only live a day. Normal platelets live seven to 10 days normally, but transfused platelets are typically one to three days. And that's why you need repeated uh, platelet transfusions. Red cells normally live 120 days. So maybe if you have a red cell transfusion, that will last you a few weeks because the red cells last a few weeks. So the rate at which you need transfusions depend on what sort of cells you actually require uh, and what needs to be done with them. So HLA matching is a way of reducing reactions, hopefully prolong the life of the platelets or the white cells if you're given white cells, but it does mean more faff in actually getting those particular products. So you tend to have to wait a bit longer and you're probably more likely to come one day and be booked in for the following day while I do all those sort of things. So at the end of the day, Britain is very, very good. The National Blood Service has been one of the stalwarts of the healthcare system in Britain. It's free. In most countries, it's paid donors. Uh, that's why uh, there's a premium on the cost of things. Uh, and UK is free, but we've never ever managed enough blood to produce all our own plasma. We've always had to get some from abroad, but before BSE came along, we were getting 70, 80% of our own plasma importing the rest. 
uh, and hopefully we will get back to that situation and there'll be a big push for blood donors. We have enough donors for the red cell demand. We still need more donors because platelet demand. And if we do our own plasma, we need even more uh, donors for that to try and make ourselves self-sufficient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. That was a terrific overview. I'm running through questions from everybody at the moment and I see between yourself and Julie, you've managed to answer quite a few and a few acknowledgements from the audience already. Um, I guess I've got an initial question that maybe I could uh, address to Julie and, and, and to Hayley. Um, with patients reporting that they've, and, and you also confirming that, um, that uh, infusions of immunoglobins, if I fo focus on that for starters, um, being delayed or doses reduced or strategies uh, in for stop. We have questions that are asking um, if patients have concerns about their blood products being reduced uh, in the shortage, um, who should they talk to? Um, uh, and can they challenge this? And, and is, I think, in our chat earlier before Haley, you alluded that these are local decisions by different healthcare trusts. So I'm just wondering if if yourselves could expand a little bit. Um, maybe Haley first. Um, so yeah, they are local decisions that are made by clinicians, but we look at the patient and we're looking at many different things. So what their infection frequency is. Um, what their immunoglobulin levels are, um, and we factor all of that in to our decision making. So if we see a patient who um, has had no infections in the past 12 months, um, whose immunoglobulin trough levels are 15, then we will look at trying to reduce, either reduce their dose or stop them um, for a period of time. So give them a trial off treatment. And in most cases at the moment, what we're doing is we're bringing them back in three months time um, to see how they've been getting on. Because it generally will take around three months for the immunoglobulin to completely wash out um, of the system. Um, but although they're local decisions, we're sort of held to account by NHS guidance as well. And certainly with secondary immune deficiencies, we should be from time to time um, reviewing all these decisions um, anyway regarding the, the, the reason for starting um, and trialing and in many cases patients should when they're consented should be informed that it's a trial of treatment. Thanks Heidi. That answer the question. <laughs> I think that does. Um, so it's it's a trial it's a bit experimental at the moment um, and it's going to be very individual. From if so, so theoretically, people should be explained reasons for change in in the practice. Yeah. Yes, um, absolutely. We would, we would hope so. Julie, have you got anything to add to 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 to, to the area of um, continued access, or even maybe just expand on? I know you were touching on the guidelines. Um, you know, one of one of the concerns that patients have voiced is 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 difficulty in actually being able to start on the therapy is is and you touched on that this is going to be toughened up perhaps um, um because of there's such a broad population that requires the therapy yeah i completely agree with what Haley was saying and so we have national guidance so patients should receive treatment you know the standards for receiving treatment are the same across the country the national guidance applies to everyone um and all patients should be being reviewed regularly to ensure that they're still benefiting, benefiting from their treatment. Um, I think it comes down to a little bit of what's available um, as well in the product type. So some patients may well still be benefiting, but I know locally we've been quite reliant on one product. Um, there's not going to be so much of that available for a little while. So um, our patients locally may need to move to a different product. So I guess some people need to be aware that that might be something that might happen um, where we can, we try and maintain patients on the same product. 
but if that's not possible then we do need to look at the alternatives um, and what's available to us at that time um, you did mention new patients starting I'm not expecting the new guidance to have any changes for secondary antibody deficiency. We're expecting them to say the same thing. Um, the bits that I outlined about the criteria they, that patients have experienced infections um, in the last six months, despite having um, being on antibiotics. So we're not expecting that to change. So if a patient was eligible before, they should be eligible again. Um, but it might just be which product is available at that time at that hospital. Thank you, Julie and Hayley. Just staying on topic, I was just wondering from a clinical perspective uh, for leukemia patients, Chris, um, if you were able to, um, I don't know how, but to answer some of the questions that have been coming from patients that the timing of this issue um, although there's always been an issue of, uh, uh, you know, that it's a limited, there's a limited pool of, uh, of, of, of available immunoglobins, for example, but the timing with COVID and fear of people who are immune compromised getting ill and having to access uh, healthcare whilst there's so much, or, or even um, uh, have, <laughs> having to integrate with society, you know, there's a fear of people getting ill. And that um, putting themselves at further risk of, of infection. Um, it, are you able to share anything from a doctor's point of view for patients that are concerned in this area of what this really means to them? Well, a, a few things, Nick. I mean, hemoglobin price jumped up about 15 years ago. Uh, it went up about fivefold. Wow. From about two thousand pound a year to twelve, thirteen thousand, maybe even more than that now in a competitive market, and the reason for that was simply supply and demand. You know, dare I say, it, parts of the world have risen, the likes of China, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a global product because you can heat it, you can transport it around the world relatively easy. So the price basically shot up, which made everyone focus a bit more on where we're using it appropriately, who we we're using it with. I have a real issue with the guidelines. If, if you take the CLL studies, which performed in the late 80s and 90s, that showed clinical benefit from immunoglobulins, to enter the study, the cutoff was actually six grams per deciliter. There's been no study in CLL using four as a threshold. So these are arbitrary, almost pragmatic guidelines to try and make sure those most in need get uh, the chance of benefits. That doesn't mean you can't benefit if your uh, immunoglobulin IgG level is six grams per deciliter. So it comes back to that holistic approach to the patient, because you have patients who may have a IgG level of eight grams per deciliter who are still getting recurrent infections. They've got COPD, their immunoglobulin is maybe normal. Those people are more likely to benefit from the antibiotic side of thing because correcting the immunoglobulins will only give a marginal benefit. You have people who do have IgG levels of two or three who have no infections at all, and they don't need blood products. These are expensive and not without their own potential problems. So to take that holistic approach and have a discussion, that's why the annual review is so important. And have you actually got the level correct? We tend to, a lot of centers give it, it a single set dose for every person. Well, in theory, we've all got different blood volumes. If you've got a relatively small blood volume, because you're five foot one and weigh eight stone, you'll be getting a lot more IgG than someone who's 25 stone with a BMI of 50. But we tend to treat them all the same and, and one size fits all. So I think dialogue between the patient, the clinical nurse specialist, the medic, which feeds into the pharmacy and clinical nurse specialist aspect is, is really, really important. In general terms, the best results I've seen are people with recurrent chest infections. I've had less success with people with recurrent UTIs. And often because recurrent UTIs, the immunoglobulin may be playing a role, but there may be other lo local factors like the bladder not emptying problem uh, properly, hydronephosis that make the urinary tract uh, a bit more colonized with bacteria and the, uh, and the immunoglobulins don't really penetrate uh, the urine in uh, as well as it does the bronchial secretions. So I've had less success with UTIs, 
than I have with the chest. So I think it is about open dialogue. And that's why I don't really agree with the guidelines with a cutoff in four, because it implies if you're above four, you don't need it. I'm afraid that's factually incorrect. But we have to live in the real world of uh, it's not an endless supply. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, hopefully that will answer some questions, um, you know, with regards to patients who are worried about infections they used to get and therefore finding it hard to have to step away. I know with people having to shield, that hasn't been so much of an issue in the past, but um, I think one question that's just been raised by everybody, because we've been talking about shortages in blood products, um, Julie, um, maybe you could answer this if, if possible. Is there any clarity exactly which products we're short of? Or is, it, is this across all blood products? Should, you know, because a few patients are obviously concerned hearing about these shortages and, and sometimes these interventions are needed quite quickly. Yeah, so products. we've been told by NHS England that there is enough product available in the UK, but I think there's more of an acute shortage of the intravenous um, immunoglobulin. So they've managed to get some more subcut and they've ordered in a different brand that we're not so familiar with in the UK called Panzyga. So we have other brands of immunoglobulin coming into the country, but I think there's still a small shortfall, which is why they have asked us to review all patients, ensure we're complying with the national guidelines, reduce people that are on home care prescriptions. People might have experienced that previously you might have had two or three months delivered, but they're trying to ask everyone just to have a month at a time um, to try and smooth out some of the peaks in demand. Um, so there are a number of steps they've asked each hospital to carry out, but they have reassured us that there is enough product across the whole of treating everyone it just might be that we might need to move some patients that were having intravenous therapy to subcutaneous therapy thank you julie it's difficult i want us to be able to address some broader topics but whilst we're on immunoglobins i noticed the word subcut subcutaneous and we've got Haley with us um, uh, it would be really helpful if you were able to explain Haley um, in a little bit of uh, from a practical point of view of how immunoglobulins are administered and, and uh, how the difference between subcutaneous administration and uh, um, intravenous and the, the pros and cons from the clinical perspective and advantages you see for, for patients. And then perhaps we can re uh, answer that rhetorically. And then I'd like to go to... Um, Esther, and if we can then talk about a few other blood products, that would be good. Um, yeah, so uh, immunoglobulin can be delivered in two ways, so intravenously or subcutaneously. Um, and at my centre, we offer both, um, both administrations. We equally offer this to patients to do at home. So we train them to administer intravenously at home uh, and subcutaneously. Um, there's the main differences between the two is the sort of the interval between um, the administration times. So generally intravenous is every three to four weeks on average um, and subcutaneous um, depending, we can use like a rapid push. So that could be um, just a single injection um, once a week or we use a pump, which could either be weekly or fortnightly. Um, so the, those are the, the main dif differences. So obviously intravenous is into a vein and subcutaneously is into your fatty tissue. So generally we would train patients to do either into their tummies or their legs or anywhere where they can pinch up some fat. So anything else? I can't remember what else you asked. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that. I say things in a very long-winded <laughs> way. Um, yeah, I, I was going to suggest from that point of view, it leads into a question about, obviously, if uh, 
intravenous has to be administered as a day patient at the hospital in most so cases. We can train patients to do it at home. We've got a number from this centre that um, are trained to administer at home. All patients, I, I would add, from this centre are set up with a home care company. So they will generally get deliveries out every three months um, is what we are uh, delivery arrangements are with that company. Um, and then we would do, um, we would aim to do annual reassessments every 12 to 18 months um, and where we would bring the patient back in. Um, we used to go out to them, we just can't do that now um, just with, with time. So we bring the patients back in and they do their infusion in front of us. So we observe them preparing and administering an infusion just to ensure that they're, they're safe still with that. And this is something at, at the Birmingham Trust that you're able to do in the community, that people don't have to come into uh, as day patients? To... No, no. Um, both both treatments can be delivered in the community. Okay. And it's, the training it's aspect? that we can get, get the community teams to um, facilitate the treatment. Um, usually we would train the patients themselves or... Um, uh, a relative or a friend or someone if the patient was unable to do it themselves um, but yeah so it's rare that we can get the community teams as in the community nurses to take that on um, we've got the odd patient here um, but there's a lot of pressure on those services now and they they, they are reluctant to take on a long-term treatment Okay, thanks. That's really helpful. I, I was just related to one question that's come in that somebody was to start on subcutaneous, but uh, I'm not sure where that is location wise, but that has been stopped. And then I think there might have been access issues with um, intravenous. Um, if people want to discuss um, uh, these issues, who should they talk to on this, Hayley? Um, if they got issues around access and around exploring what might be available? I think initially they need to speak to their <laughs> clinical teams about it um, and if they get no joy from that then they could go via the PALS teams within, within the hospitals um, and also speak to the patient organisations like yourselves um, who do lobby uh, um, for patients. So. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, one last question. Um, Chris, you covered in oversight uh, safety in terms of how blood products are made clean for the immune compromised, uh, for those that they help. Um, are, we're, as patients, we're all used to being administered drugs or products and nothing is risk free. Um, are there any significant risks with using these products? Um, that patients should be aware of? Um, no, on the whole, blood, blood products in the UK are very, very, very safe. Uh, they're probably amongst the safest in the world because of our pool of donors tend to be healthy, unpaid people. They're volunteers. So they're not coming from people who have to donate for, for reasons other than maybe altruism. So we do have a phen phenomenally good product to start with. And we do have a very good national blood service uh, and blood bank systems throughout the UK. You've got to be very unlucky for something to happen to you. But the more blood products you have, the more your chance of being unlucky uh, uh, with that. So most errors, in fact, in blood transfusion are at the taking of the blood sample from the wrong patient or the wrong label being put on the bottle or the wrong name being written on the bottle. And that's why from a patient perspective, you'd always have your wristband on when anybody's taking blood off you, especially if they're going to be cross-matching you and the person taking the blood should go for the procedure, checking your name, your address, your date of birth and making sure you are who you are and making sure the right sticky label goes on the form. Uh, our hospitals, I suspect most of actually, you're not allowed to put the sticky label on the bottle anymore. You have to write it on. And that's another opportunity to ask the patient again, what is your name? So patients need to be aware the biggest risk is actually the taking of the blood sample at that time. And do make sure the healthcare professionals are doing the procedure correctly, that you've got your wristband on uh, and that they're asking you what your name, date of birth and address is. Because that's where if serious things are going to happen, ABO mismatches, that's when it occurs. Okay, that's, that's good. 
a little segue there. I think we've still got a question there about irradiated blood products and uh, who should receive irradiated blood products. Who should in the transfusions? Who should who should be the patients that receive irradiated blood products, and and also um, uh, a couple of questions asked about carrying cards about this and and where are these available? Um, yeah. So irradiated blood product back to those red cells that whole blood the person donates and you put it in the center, you spin it down, you squeeze from the bottom, so the plasma, the white cells and the um, platelets come off the top. There's always, always a tiny number of white cells left in the red cells, always. So if you are very, very, very immunosuppressed, typically post-allergenic transplantation, you have no immune system, then those lymphocytes, those white cells in that bag of red cells that you are being transfused, or in that bag of platelets you're being transfused, can actually react to you. So you can get uh, a reaction the other way around. Normally blood product is the patient reacting to the product. Here is the product reacting to the patient because you have no immune system. Normally in a normal person who's getting white cells and the red cells, they are getting a little bit of contamination. Your own immune system kills those white cells off. So the people get radiated blood product are allergenic, uh, transplant recipients, bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant recipients in general, in some very rare, typically children's disorders where they have virtually no immune system at all. Uh, aplastic anemia likewise. So really, really severely immunosuppressed people should have irradiated blood products. Uh, it's nothing to do with infection control or anything. It's purely to do with there is by chance any white cells in that bag of red cells that those are killed off and irradiation does that. Thanks, Chris. That's actually raised uh, another question there, which is, I think during chemo immunotherapy with FCR, um, irradiated blood was always, and, and uh, I myself had to carry a card. Um, is that for the period of during the treatment or is that then for life? Because there was discussion about this and how significant is, people are worried about in emergencies and, and, and the card carrying aspect. Yeah, so typically if you look at uh, a patient's immune system after various therapies, if you look after FCR, it takes about 12 months after FCR for your immune system to recover adequately, then that probably the risk just plummets. Uh, I do remember seeing a case that happened about 18 months after FCR. So some people use a, a cutoff of two years post FCR. Ironically, although we talk about chemotherapy being immunosuppressive, uh, the truth of the matter is the purine analogs, high dose steroids, uh, are the really immunosuppressive therapies. High dose steroids used in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, in myeloma. Uh, so if you take acute myeloid leukemia, Although the patients are a bit immunosuppressed, they're not really receiving drugs unless you get flag is part of, fludarabin is part of the flag regimen. They're really not immunosuppressed enough to require irradiated blood products. So it's, it's all about how immunosuppressive is the chemotherapy regimen you're being given. Thank you, Chris. Apologies to the, the member in the audience when I use the word FCR. Uh, that's a uh, fludarabin, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab treatment for a CLL patient using a particular analog, pure and analog therapy that Chris has just alluded to has that impact. But you've just answered an important question that there is potentially a time duration when uh, irradiate products are, are important. Um, but... Yeah, yeah, probably after allergenic transplant, the recommendation is lifelong irradiated. That's probably not necessary in reality, but it's a relatively small number of patients. And there's certainly been patients who had allergenic transplant and there's no irradiated blood available. There are many years post-transplant, they've had come in with an RTA and you've just had to give them what's available because you can't wait for the irradiated blood product to arrive from the blood transfusion service. Uh, and they're nearly, well, they are, they're always okay if you're more than five years out. But some allergenic transplant, they'll say it's for life. And that's, it's probably not a bad thing, but in general, you're probably pretty safe a few years after all these therapies. Thank you, Chris. That's really helpful. Um, 
Esther, I realise I haven't spoken to you for a little while, and um, it'd be terrific if you could maybe share with us, um, you know, your experience of receiving blood products during treatment, um, and did you have any concerns when you had to receive this, and um, did you understand how you were going to receive them? Um, you know, how important the blood donor, do you feel blood donors uh, have been for you? Yeah, well, I mean, it's been really important because it was quite um, a major part of my treatment. So I had a lot, as I said before, I had a lot of um, blood products, including blood transfusions and platelet transfusions during my treatment. So I was admitted um, as an emergency presentation of um, leukemia. So basically I'd gone to my GP that morning, had some bloods done. Um, and then ended up being sent straight to hospital that afternoon um, with, and my platelet level was 13 um, when I arrived at the hospital. So um, certainly had um, transfusions almost immediately as soon as I got there, um, blood transfusions and platelet transfusions. Um, and then that was sort of continued on through the chemotherapy, which obviously affected those levels as well. Um, and then in between times, when the levels were lowered, had more transfusions then as well. So it became sort of a regular part of, of my treatment for, um, for the four months that I was having treatment. And um, so certainly, I think I probably had underestimated how important it is for people to be blood donors. Um, and actually, I'm a nurse myself, so you, d okay. you do have knowledge of this. So um, I've given blood transfusions in the past. I used to work in accident and emergency. So it was something that, you know, you do to other people. And then obviously coming at it from a different perspective, it, you know, it just it, it was just totally different being a patient and having to receive that and just re realising how important it was in, in, in the treatment that I received. That's uh, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, just to ask a question, you were treated as an inpatient. You you haven't had to receive any blood products as an outpatient and attend hospital And um, so no, I did. I had both. So um, as an inpatient, but then also I came um, to the day um, day centre to have um, transfusions there um, as an outpatient as well. So we'd come in for the few hours to have those transfusions and then go back home again. Um, and I was having to have the platelet transfusions every other day um, for quite a lot of the time, and it's. Um, during one of my inpatient stays as well, I had um, an episode of active bleeding from my gums as well, where the leukemia cells had spread to the gums. Um, so at that point, I was having uh, platelet transfusions daily and sometimes multiple times a day as well, just to try and control that. So, yeah, this was, experience of both. This was during the peak of COVID? Yeah. So I was diagnosed in May 2020, just in right into the first lockdown. So, yeah. Not the best oh. time, but <laughs> how safe did you feel when you were balancing the need uh, versus the infection in the community? Was that a worry for you? Yeah, I mean it was because obviously it was quite early into the pandemic, so we just, I guess we didn't really know what was going on, and it was quite a scary time anyway. But in some respects, I felt like that was the, la the least of my problems at the time, um, yeah. and I did feel really safe in the hospital. Um, and the staff that looked after me were amazing. They were. Uh, you know, I couldn't praise them highly enough, really. It was, they were fantastic. So um, obviously the difficulty was you couldn't have any visitors. So you didn't see anyone for such a long time, which was really hard. But yeah, no, certainly, um, certainly COVID was, was definitely not, not my main concern at the time. But thankfully, I was so lucky that I, I didn't contract COVID at all um, during any of my treatment. And since then either, thankfully as well, which has been great. So I've been really lucky. Yeah, so that's that's really insightful. I think you know one thing that's really coming out of this um, discussion so far is the need for donors and the need for blood to make more blood products. So hopefully we can um, really strongly carry this message forward. Mm -hmm. the, the, Actually, can I just say as well, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I'm just thinking, just talking about blood donors as well. Um, just thinking, you know, the fact that I had to have the HLA and matched platelets as well. Um, and just realizing, you know, like the cost of each bag of platelets for me to have as well was like, it's, it's high, but you know, there's just not so many available and it's not like you could just have them. They were just there, you know, they had to be, I think patients had to be brought in to, to donate specifically for me and those were from uh, places around the country. So they didn't, couldn't just have them from Newcastle, which is where I was treated. Um, they came from different places. So the nurses would come in every day and say, oh, this one's come from Liverpool or this one's come from so-and-so. And even just thinking that, you know, people have specifically come and do donated those for me was like, that was really amazing as well. 
Absolutely. <laughs> um, that leads us on to a question which, which was on the similar lines because, you know, some people have got um, worries about attending hospital now, you know, in the day centres for infusions of different types. I've just, I know we've touched on this many times during COVID, but Chris and, and uh, Julie and, and Hayley, I've just wondered if you could share um, how safe things are in in in, uh, in in the hospital setting in the daycare setting now with um changes to um you know uh uplifting of certain guidance because patients are um th there's a couple of questions around worries about they have with receiving infusions and one of those is around how safe is it in the hospital environment now for them with regards to covid for example have, has anything changed since the 19th and how safe is it? Do you have anything in, you know, what do you have in place? So, um, obviously I operate out of a day, day unit. So um, we socially distance all our patients. So we it's a fairly small unit. We we only ha had eight chairs maximum um, and we, re we reduced that capacity to 50%. So, and we're still running at 50% um, each infusion day. Um, there tends to be sort of one-way systems within departments um, and certainly at the, this trust um, the restrictions are still in place in terms of visiting um, and your social distancing and mask wearing um, and so forth and there's obviously hand gel stations and masks um, on entries um, to depart and exits to departments. Thanks Hayley, that, I hope that's helpful. Chris you're in Wales, um, any, any uh... Yeah, so in the height of the pandemic, hospitals were trying to split themselves into green, amber and red areas. Red areas, where the, that's where the COVID patients were. The so green areas is where you hoped there was nobody with COVID. And the amber areas were typically where patients have recently been admitted, they haven't been tested yet, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so in haematology in Cardiff, we had the green area, which was the ward which we knew everyone was tested regularly and was negative staff and patients. Then you have the amber area, which was the patients who've just come in the last 24, 48 hours while waiting the result for everyone. So they tried to carry on that scheme at the same time as maintaining the social distancing. The thing that's made it really safe is virtually all the staff have been vaccinated because an awful lot of patients caught the disease, caught COVID off staff nurses, cleaners, doctors, in the two, three days when they were uh, preclinical, uh, pre-symptomatic, that's when an awful lot of patients caught COVID in the hospital. We now know that the vaccination, apart from protecting yourself from catching COVID, also reduces the time when you can actually spread the disease to other people. So the hospital is phenomenally safer than it was 12 months ago, for example. Uh, so a hospital acquired COVID infections for patients is now very, very unusual. Not impossible, but very unusual. I have to weigh up that balance. How is it important getting my, my therapy versus the risk? You can never say never, uh, but uh, the whole hospitals are much, much more safer than they ever were uh, 12 months ago. And it's mostly vaccination that's done that. Thanks, Chris and, and Hayley. That's, that's really helpful. Um, there's questions there about um, different, you know, with regards to attending day centre to have to have um, uh, intravenous infusions and um, the alternative of subcutaneous. I suppose one, one of the things I'd like to add as a patient, there are pros and cons too, from a comfort and a personal point of view, that um, myself, there is a benefit being able to infuse subcutaneously at home um, I never realised that there was potentially an alternative option, but from a physical com comfort point of view, subcutaneous infusion isn't as comfortable um, as, as um, intravenous because you live with some discomfort. It's a small price to pay for four or five days, and uh, you know there's there's a lot to be weighed up in that. I've got another sa uh, safety question, um, which which was around why so people concerned about reactions to transfusion and infusions 
and um, maybe you could explain why these have ministered so slowly, Haley and, 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 and Chris, um, the amount of time that has to be spent for a blood transfusion of red cells, um, time spent needed sitting in a chair, and likewise for immunoglobins. It, is that to, to reduce safety concerns of reactions, clots, things of that nature? Um, so each manufacturer will come with a set of guidelines. Um, so generally we work out um, infusion rates and each trust will operate different, slightly differently. Um, within this trust, um, we gradually increase our rates just through experience. We've found that patients can experience more side effects if we suddenly go from um, 30 mils an hour up to 280 mils an hour. So a gradual increase can sometimes help to um, minimise those side effects with patients. They're more at risk of reactions um, if they're carrying an underlying um, infection. Um, and we often will see patients that come in, you ask them whether they're okay, everything all right, yes, I'm fine. Um, and then midway through their infusion, they start to develop chest tightness, backache, um, and so forth, and then admit actually they'd been feeling a little bit under the weather with um, a chesty cough, um, the sputum colours changed. Um, it's rare that those patients will um, deny those symptoms uh, next time that they come back. And so we do always try to counsel them. You know, it's not going to make you better. It can actually make you feel worse because they think that having their immunoglobulin is going to be the treatment. But actually what they need at that point is antibiotics, not the immunoglobulin. We can delay that for a couple of weeks and then get back on track. Thanks, Hayley. Uh, hopefully that will help. Um, uh, Chris, other, other, other types of transfusion infusion? Well, the reason why red cells are given relatively slowly is simply the volume you're infusing. If you look at a particular a person's blood volume, it's typically somewhere around five litres, the average person. If you're given three bags of blood of 200 or so mils, you're giving them 600 mils of extra fluid. That fluid can precipitate in your lungs and give you pulmonary edema. So uh, you can be acutely short of breath simply to, due to the volume of blood you've got inside you. So the point there in giving the blood slowly, as well as reducing the risk of reaction and the speed of reaction and the extent of reaction, is actually to stop fluid overload uh, and cardiac overload. So there's no easy way around that with red cells. It's deliberately given slowly to avoid that. Uh, and the older you are and the more dicky your ticker is, uh, the slower you probably need it given. It's been helped because, as I say, in the old days, you had to give about 400 mils of blood. We've now concentrated down to about 2 to 5 mils. So you're given less volume per unit. But that's the rationale behind going slow. It's to reduce reactions and reduce fluid overload. OK. Um, yeah. I, I, Esther, um, how did you feel about the amount of time you had to spend in the chair? Did, did that negatively affect your quality of life or did you feel it was ultimately beneficial? I do yeah. recall myself having a sore bum a lot of the time, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, well, I guess I knew that it was going to be a long time. So if you were having a blood transfusion, you knew it was going to be like about an hour and a half for each bag if you were having two bags and then plus the time it takes to have the bloods and everything else set up and everything. So I think... To be honest, I probably just went in knowing I was going to be there a long time and that was the treatment that I needed. And actually, when I was anemic, yeah, like you felt unwell, felt really short of breath and knew that I couldn't do as much and that I would get tired really easily. So actually, it was worth it to just sit there and have it, knowing that the next day I would feel a lot better. So, yeah, I think I just had to, it was just, I was happy to go and just put up with it. It was fine. <laughs> yeah, I can relate. A necessary evil. Yeah, um, An inconvenience. You write off a whole day. But I used to have a measurement when I was walking down the hall to hematology, uh, to the day centre, how long before I started to feel dizzy. 
was always a good indication of how much yeah, definitely. I needed I that work. Knew. And that yeah. gave the incentive, I'm going to sit down and, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I would just say, I knew if I got out of the shower and I had to sit down, I needed a blood transfusion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I used to think it was just because I was very tall. If I stood up too quickly, the blood left my head. Um, <laughs> I've got a question that maybe Chris and Hayley could, could answer. Um, we've got a question from somebody that's got functional immune deficiency and, and is wondering, how is this related to the topic of the conversation today? Um, if, so if they have functional immune deficiency, um, is that broadly covered by immunoglobins or are there other areas of functional immune deficiency that um, blood products are important? So this is, this is one of the things, Nick, is why you know, the CLL immunoglobulin guidelines I don't really agree with. When we talk about yeah. immunodeficiency, usually we're talking about antibody production because we can do something about antibodies by giving IVIG. Uh, antibodies are produced by B lymphocytes, but to B lymphocytes to function properly, you have to have the T lymphocytes functioning properly because they work together to give you the antibody response. And if you take CLL cell, uh, CLL patients, they've had over 50 different T cell abnormalities described in them. So not only do they have low antibodies, they have fun, uh, dysfunctional T cells as well. I think what this patient's referring to is probably the antibody levels are normal or the lymphocyte subsets you look at look normal, but they don't respond normally. So I think, I think that's why they're using the term functional uh, in that context, but in the sense, the only thing you can really do anything about is the low antibody levels. Thank you, Chris. That's um, really helpful. Whilst I've got you on the line, um, there's a question following up when we were talking about the uh, card for irradiated blood products and somebody's yeah. five years out of chemo um, asking if yeah. they can give up their card now. How would they find yeah. out? Well, you know, uh, doctors believe in not a human. Uh, it's simpler to say, carry on doing what you're doing rather than stop doing what you're doing. But if you think logically, if you've had FCR, you typically get cotrimoxazole or acyclovir anywhere between six months and two years. And that's because your risk of catching uh, pneumocystis pneumonia diminishes enormously if your immune system recovers. So if the same immune cells uh, you're talking about. So we stopped the PCP prophylaxis uh, certainly by two years. Uh, some places do it six months after FCR. But it's easy to say carry on carrying the card. So there's no harm in carrying it. But if I was in a road traffic accident, I wouldn't be saying don't give me the cells, red cells to keep me alive. I'll wait the hour for the irradiated ones because you may not be there an hour later. Um, uh, if you don't have it. So five years on, everyone will say carry on carrying the card, but by all likelihood, it's probably not required, but no one's going to tell you to stop doing that, and certainly not me. Thank you, Chris. You've answered two in one there because we had a question asking about how important irradiated blood was in an extreme emergency. Um, and I think you kind of covered that there. Well, the, the thing in the extreme emergency, uh, usually you're bleeding, so the blood you're being given is also leaking out onto the roadside or your kitchen if by chance you've had a hematemesis and vomited up from your gastric ulcer. So the infused cells are also being moved, moved out of you as well. Yeah, I always say we save the patient today, uh, save the emergency, and we'll think about what, what could have been improved on the next day. You can, for example, give steroids to kill off lymphocytes you may have infused. There may be other things you can do, but uh, you've got to survive that day first. Great. Um, that, that's, that's helpful. It, from, from my own point of view, it, you've answered questions that I've had in my mind for a long time. Um, I, I just mindful hate of time. I think we're OK at the moment. Hayley, I've got a question following on. When we were having a discussion about immunoglobins and maybe as, if there's a misunderstanding of why do infections potentially get worse when immunoglobins are administered? I know myself, because you know I, I can allude with the others, I, I receive uh, immunoglobins and there's always a concern about questions on the, on the sheets and everything else 
um, and questions about if you have an infection before immunoglobins are administered. Is, is, is that understood correctly um, by the person who's asking the question, why do infections get worse with immunoglobins when they're administered? They don't get worse, but um, it just may be become more apparent um, as an inflammatory, the immune's inflammatory response that um, there is an infection there. And so they then, as a result of giving the immunoglobulin, you then start to get side effects whilst having that treatment, which can, symptoms can be chest tightness, wheeze, backache, headache, and more severe. Um, so almost always we will delay treatment if there is active infection that is not treated. If they've had antibiotics um, for around 48 hours to 72 hours where symptoms have started to improve, then um, we would um, consider giving the treatment um, maybe with um, antihistamine cover um, or so on. That, that's that's what I thought. That's really helpful to explain that. Um, you know, there's one thing as patients will always experience that when we see a new face and somebody asks the question, do you require cover or not? Um, that explains that for us. Um, an interesting question from somebody at the moment, and, and, and I do recall an answer um, in CLL, but is it possible to be a donor, a blood donor, if you're a leukemia patient? Um, Julie, uh, I, 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 do you have knowledge in that area or, or would that be one for you, Chris? Yeah, I don't know, sorry. If... In general terms, they don't like people with active illnesses being blood donors of any sort. The reality is you, you can't give a patient, if you're a CLL patient, but you didn't know you had CLL, um, and you gave a, a bag of blood, you got infused to someone, they're not going to catch CLL from you. You don't need to worry about that. The reason why they're not particularly interested in people with other illnesses, of course, the hemoglobin is probably not normal. The immune cells won't be normal. The platelets may not be right. Their antibodies may be low. You may have autoantibodies yourself, as you know, 10 to 20% of CLL patients develop autoantibodies to red cells. That's autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If you gave those to a patient, you may well hemolyze their red cells if you happen to have those sort of antibodies. So it's a, it's a sort of blanket thing. But that's why, as you'll know, there's recently been people with HIV can now donate blood again in yeah. Wales. That used to be an absolute no-no because of the um, potential perceived uh, that the blood may not be as good as from someone who'd never had HIV. And over time, people have accepted that's not the case. So as I say, for red cells, we have enough donors. So they're not going around trying to find people with other illnesses who would still be suitable. Um, but if we get on for plasma and everything, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the guidelines change on who can be a blood donor uh, or a pharesis donor, uh, and we get a bit more uh, or a bit less fussy over who we accept, because uh, you know, as needs must. So, carrying on around that line of thought, you know, different leukemia types, acute leukemia patients that have three to five years outside out of treatment, uh, you know. Are they included in, in, in this list of exclusions? They, have, they were historically, and that was partly because we've no idea what infections they may have been given themselves that we don't know about, that haven't been discovered yet, et cetera, et cetera, because they've had a typical AML patient may get up to 50 units of blood during the course of their three, six months of therapy, depending on what they have done. But again, by all likelihood, they're perfectly able if they've been in remission two, three years. They're almost certainly cured. They've almost certainly not contracted any uh, infections nowadays. So they put, probably can be blood, blood donors. Um, one has to be slightly wary. Anyone who's had chemotherapy for any disease has it affected their own bone marrow and their normal production of red cells. So even if you've had breast cancer and had chemotherapy, Will you then recover your own haemoglobin if you uh, act as a blood donor? How long will it take you to recover your own haemoglobin? 
uh, from that because some chemotherapy regimens used in solid tumors, platinum based regimens used in breast cancer, ovarian cancer, are very damaging to the bone marrow. So, a bit of it, it's a blanket. People with cancer, beavers' cancer, can't donate blood. But that's as I say, it's a very broad brush that. At the moment, that's that's where we are. Okay, thanks for for that. I've always wondered myself on that question, being told that the only part of me that I could donate is my cornea. After uh, uh, I don't know how much truth is in that, and what use is a, is a secondhand cornea? Um, Looking at your glasses, Nick, I'm not sure they are. Well, this one's totally shot. I can tell you. Um, and just just a quickie, um, mindful of time. You mentioned BSE aka mad cow disease yeah um is this still an issue in 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 in, in the population you know is this is what you've alluded to as preventing development of uk-based blood products in the past it, it certainly isn't a clinical issue mm -hmm. there are still one or two cases a year but it's not a clinical mass population issue but at the time when all the scare came nobody knew um I remember going to American Society of Hematology uh, meeting and someone's congratulating me on my experiment. I thought he was talking about the work I'd done. Uh, no, he's talking to me talking to me about eating British beef because uh, he basically did an experiment of 30 million people eating the stuff and nobody knew, absolutely nobody knew what would happen. But that was 20 years ago and now we all think actually that uh, if we were infected, it's at such a low, low, low level there isn't a risk with blood transfusion anymore uh, from it. Um, so uh, that, that's why we're back on the plasma front, I think. Well, I think um, I'm mindful of time and we've just about covered everybody's questions, unless any come in from the audience uh, in the 11th hour. I, really, I suppose before just rounding off with some finishing slides, I was just wondering if each person by turn might wish to share a message about um, use of blood products, this the importance to them as a clinician or as a patient, and, uh, you know, looking forward, some messaging that you might want to leave as a parting shot. Um, I'd finish with you, uh, Esther, so I was going to maybe offer that over to um, Hayley and then Julie, if you've got anything you'd like to say. Um, bearing in mind that you're often the person that's got to talk to patients in the current climate and you're the one struggling without resources. Yeah, I just think, you know, personally and professionally, we, you know, decisions are not taken lightly, um, what we have to do. And we do look at every individual patient as an individual, um, despite the fact that, um, you know, we are bound by guide guidance um, from above. Um, we will look at that individual um, and review everything about that individual and it goes uh, through our team. So we have multidisciplinary teams where those decisions are made there as, as a collective and discussed. Um, so it's not just one clinician making that decision about an individual. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can get on top of this situation. Um, so that those that really, really need it, get it. Thank you, Hayley. That was really helpful, especially alluding to the fact that it's a panel of clinicians that discuss your specific case, not just in an individual person. Julie, Crystal Ball, looking forward. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, so nothing much to add to what Hayley said. Exactly the same, that we try and keep the patient at the heart of all these decisions. And that's what we're trying to do, make sure the right people are getting the right products where, wherever we can. Um, and it's been a bumpy road with some blood products. Um, but yeah, hopefully it's on the right people's agenda. So you'd hope things would improve rather than get worse in the future. So perhaps a bit of awareness raising from our side as advocates of the issues um, could help both ends of the chain. Yeah, I think the shortage has been a little bit worse this year um, than we've seen before. Um, so hopefully things will improve as they put plans in place. Excellent. And Prof, any parting shots? 
Um, really, two things just to mention. Immunoglobulin is also used for some very acute neurological disorders, and those are medical emergencies, and they can be life-saving there and then. So we're not the only people uh, asking for immunoglobulins. And uh, I think it was Haley, Julie touched on Kawasaki's disease in children is a, a you know tr a disease which really really does respond well. So the indications outside hematology have grown a little as well, and that's led to the competition. Uh, in reality, in general, blood products, uh, they are very safe in the UK, but I think you do need to ask yourself, uh, if I'm not bruising or bleeding, do I really need to plate it? So if I feel fine, I'm not short of breath, I have enough energy, or do I really need the red cells? One thing, especially for men, if you've got acute leukemia uh, or maybe even myeloma, you'll, you'll be given a lot of iron in red cells which may actually later on, 5, 10, 15 years later, deposit in your body and cause organ trouble. So certainly if you've been heavily, heavily transfused in the past, especially men, but also women, because if you stop your periods because your chemotherapy and they never come back or you stop your periods anyway, then you should ask your doctor to check your iron levels because it's very easy to get rid of the iron. They take the bag of blood off you and throw it away. And you remove the iron that way. So for those long-term survivors, just beware uh, about the how much iron have you actually received and all those blood products you've received. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, a lot to take on there, take on board there. That's really helpful. Uh, Esther, um, over to you as <laughs> the final word. Um, thoughts. So I guess just for me, it, that like my whole experience has just really emphasised how important it is for people to be blood donors if they can. Um, I mean, certainly in my treatment, uh, you know, without the blood donors, you know, who knows what could have happened. And it certainly contributed to saving my life, really. So um, I certainly wish I hadn't underestimated how important it was in the past. And although I have donated blood before, it may not be so easy or may not be possible in the future but yeah just to be able to aware, raise awareness of, of how important that is for people um because you you just never know when you might need it thank you esther um heartfelt i suppose i'd add my pennies worth in is that maybe i could ask everybody that's in the audience if you uh, are able to um, i certainly will do i do a lot of campaigning and make a lot of noise when i can on social media you know, if you see campaigns that are promoting um, blood donor or, or, or encouraging people to donate, please, please uh, help drive these campaigns. And, and if you've got concerns around access, around the topics we've been discussing, you know, please don't hesitate to get in touch with, with, with your, clin uh, your, your clinical care team and discuss in a bit more detail and look for what the possibilities are. It sounds as if coming from today's webinar, there might be more possibilities than you'd considered in the past, considering what Haley was saying about you know, local community services that are in place there. But also more importantly, um, you know, talk to Leukemia Care if you want to. The advocacy services there can help support and advocate for you and further investigate information for you. So on that note, I'd like to thank everybody very much for attending today both our esteemed panelists, uh, really interesting discussion, uh, some fantastic information. I've learned a lot and, you know, um, I've been living with some of these issues for quite some time. So well done. That was really good stuff and great questions from the audience. Um, let's just finish with a few slides. So uh, in case you missed at the beginning, you know, please do use the website, um, the Leukemia Care website. It's really quite extensive. That'll give you access to previous and future webinars. There's a great uh, newsletter. If you're not signed up to that on permissions, please do um, uh, access that and, and the quarterly magazine. And uh, my colleague Charlotte has been running a terrific uh, series of podcasts where you can learn from other uh, patients on their experience. And uh, yeah, join us on social media. Lots of campaigns coming up, Blood Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and again, that's all on the website. Next slide, please. Ah, <laughs> talk of the devil. There's Charlotte in action. Um, yeah, so if you want to hear more from other patients, you know, uh, drop in, have a listen to a podcast.
great to you know to listen along to on your phone in your pocket earphones whilst you're doing something else really interesting way of, uh, of gaining other people's experience and our next uh webinar is well close to blood products i don't know if it is a blood product as such although it personalized one is our car t webinar which is on the 11th of august so it's coming up um, please, if you're interested in latest developments in CAR-T therapy, um, really interesting, some great uh, consultants and patients um, supporting that. Please do join us. Next slide, please. Um, ah, there we are, jumping slides. Oh, jumped again. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the moment at CAR-T therapy. Um, next slide, please. I... Aha, here we are. We have the right slides. I don't know what going, goes on with our webinars, but at the end, they always, the slides seem to jump around. I think there's something in the tool. Uh, yeah, please do get in touch with Leukemia Care and, and, and um, we've got plenty of support services available. As we said, the helpline is manned uh, weekly. Uh, a, a clinical nurse specialist is available on uh, during office hours and I think also late Fridays. We've also got a WhatsApp connection so you can talk uh, in real time using WhatsApp. Um, we have a network of, of uh, virtual support groups around 50 groups spread across the UK so if you want to connect with other patients and share experience it's a great way to do that and as I touched on earlier the advocacy team are available to support you um, with personal advocacy support welfare advice and again another way to join with other peers is join our online forums Facebook group thank you everybody on Facebook today for joining us and something that is a great success. And, uh, and I actually felt the value of it today. I got a call from a buddy, a fellow patient, somebody I work with, and I really appreciated having a chat with that person. Buddy scheme run by CLL, uh, by, by Leukemia Care and uh, across CLL and all of the other indications is a great way of connecting with somebody that understands challenges you're living with. Um, and you know, please do please, please do uh, reach out or put yourself forward if you want to be a buddy for somebody else with uh, leukemia care. And most importantly, not last but not least, leukemia care do provide a counselling fund which offers six sessions of counselling to those diagnosed or affected by a diagnosis of leukemia, um, which will help put you in touch with a counsellor to give you support at times when you need that. Uh, last slide, please. And uh, here's just the email addresses for support leukemiacare.org.uk and advocacy. And the website is at the leukemiacare.org.uk address. And if you just need to make a call or want to call us, our phone number is 08 3 phone 08 08 And well, we've finished ahead of time by four minutes. That's a rarity for me. Um, I really want to thank everybody again, our panelists, Chris, Julie, Esther, Haley. Thank you so much for giving up your time. And um, the event will be recorded and hopefully will be useful for many. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, everybody in the audience for staying. I notice everybody stayed right to the end, so we haven't bored you to death. Um, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Take care.